Hello, this is Rochelle Agatha, and this is the lecture on long-term liabilities, including bonds and notes payable. The objectives are to go over long-term liabilities, describe the characteristics, the terminology, and the pricing of bonds payable, accounting for bonds payable, bonds issued at a discount versus a premium, accounting for premium and discount, installment notes, and financial statement presentation. So first we're going to compute the potential impact of long-term borrowings on earnings per share. If you recall from the corporation chapter, we talked a lot about equity financing. Equity financing is issuing stock to get cash to fund your operations. Debt financing, on the other hand, is um, gets you cash, but you issue debt, and then you're a debtor to somebody else. So the types of debt we're talking about is in this chapter are bonds and notes. So a bond is simply a form of an interest-bearing note. It, like a note, a bond requires periodic interest payments and the face amount must be repaid at maturity. So I don't know if you're familiar with um, there's city bonds. Um, if you're a voter and you voted, you might have voted in the past on bond, school bonds, municipal bonds. Um, entities go out and they issue bonds. And if in this course we're not really talking about government accounting, but we're talking about different types of corporations that will issue bonds to get cash. And nobody's going to buy anything if they don't get something in return. And what the investor gets is the interest. So here's a typical financing plan of a corporation. As you can tell, um, we, were, we learned about all the, the stock stuff in the previous chapter. And so in this chapter, we're talking about bonds. And here you can see that under Plan 3, they have a bond, preferred and common stock. Um, so they have, each scenario has $4 million of um, debt and equity. So then um, bridging on what we learned in the previous chapter on earnings per share, here's our earnings. Every, the company would have the same earnings under each plan. However, tax-exempt bonds, you're allowed to, um, to with, um, delete or negate your earnings by the um, taxable or the, the bond interest. So here you can see that um, the income before income tax is reduced by the bond, um, the interest on the bonds. So your tax becomes lower, so your, your net income overall is um, different amongst the different plans. Then on these plans here you have um, dividends on the preferred, and then here's the available amount of dividends of income for the common stock people and here's your shares of common stock so as you can see under the different plans the common stock people get a different amount of earnings per share based on the financing plan of the company so what we learned in the corporation chapter comes to fruition in this chapter by adding in the different options of financing plans that a company has and bonds being a piece of that um, here's another scenario, similar kind of thing, but the um, the different um, scenarios with the uh, the rates on the bonds and the um, stock are in here. So you can see once again that it changes depending on the scenario itself. So just two different ways to look at it for you. And the main point of this topic is that if bonds are tax exempt, then you're allowed to deduct that interest, and it does change the overall picture. Let's talk about some characteristics of bonds and terminology. Bonds, um, bonds payable is a corporation that issues a bond enters into a contract called a bond indenture or a trust indenture. So a bond has a contract associated with it. Usually the face value of each bond is called the principal. And it's usually in multiples of a thousand. Interest on bonds may be payable annually, semi-annually, or quarterly. Most pay semi-annually. When all the bonds of an issue mature at the same time, they are called term bonds. So keep we're going to put all the terminology up here and then talk about it. If maturity dates are spread over several dates, they're called serial bonds. Bonds that may be exchanged for other securities are called convertible bonds. So you, you have choices, and when a bond is developed, all of these things are identified on the front end. Bonds that a corporation reserves the right to redeem before their maturity is called a callable bond. Now, a corporation might want to do this because maybe they needed cash for, for um, financing capital needs, and then maybe their cash needs change, and they wanted the right to call those bonds back so that they can uh, ensure that their debt-to-equity ratios remain in, in a format that is comfortable for them. So callable bonds give companies that flexibility. Bonds issued on the basis of general credit of the corporation are called 
debenture bonds. So if a corporation has great credit, then people are willing to buy possibly bonds, and those are called debenture bonds. Pricing of bonds. Um, this is one of the areas that it's. I think it's more nebulous for a, a new accounting student or professional to understand. When a corporation issues a bond, the price the buyers are willing to pay depends upon several factors. The face amount of the bonds, which is the amount due at maturity, the periodic interest rate to be paid on the bonds, so this is called the contract rate or the coupon rate, so that's the rate that's on the bond. People buy the bonds for that rate. And then the market or effective rate of interest. So the contract rate is stated on the bond. The market rate will change depending on our economy. The market or effective rate is determined by transactions between buyers and sellers of similar bonds. The market rate of interest is affected by a variety of factors. Investors' assessment of current economic conditions, future expectations, and you know, th these lump a lot of things into play, but over the last um, couple of years, we've seen a, a huge um, change in our economy and an unstable market when it comes to interest rates and um, people willing to buy um, debt. So um, that all comes into play in these factors. If the market rate equals the contract rate, then the selling price of the bond is um, is par basically. So here you see that if a bond has a face amount of a thousand and the market rate equals the contract rate, it will sell at a thousand. It will sell at face value or par. If the market rate is greater than the contract rate, then the selling price of the bond is going to sell for less than a thousand and that's called a discount. So if the market rate is higher than the contract rate, the bonds sell at a discount. If the market rate is less than the contract rate, then the bond sells at a premium. So you might want to print these slides out, and I don't, if you're a flashcard person, these are things to make flashcards with. Flashcards are a great way, I think I've mentioned it in every lecture, to really remember the terms if you're not, um, not practicing in accounting. The time value of money concept recognizes that an amount of cash to be received today is worth more than the same amount of cash to be received in the future, or so we hope. So let's talk about present value. Let's assume a $1,000 10% bond is purchased. It pays interest annually and will mature in, mature in two years. So here's today, here's two years, and the bond has to be paid in two years at $1,000. Um, you probably all have a computer or a calculator, but basically I want you to understand that the present value calculation per a table present value of one dollar at a compound interest rate. So if we look, let's just take 10%. If we say a, the period is two years and we're at 10%, we're going to use the present value factor of 0.82645 for today. We're bringing money back to today. Um, so here's our little example. So we say that that one thousand dollars times the 0.82 is only worth eight hundred and twenty six dollars today. So if we want to, to, to issue bonds today that are going to mature to be $1,000, we want to get $826 today based on the present value factor of a 10% bond. Using that same exhibit, what is the present value of $4,000 to be received in five years if the market rate of interest is 10%? So you go back to the little chart, you find the rate, and the present value would be 2483.68. So you go back to that chart and see that you can actually calculate that. So if we another example, $100 today is is per present value, um, $100 in a year is worth $90.91 today. And if it's due in two years, it's worth $82. And I'll, um, so the total of the two pieces of a bond would be $173.55. So it's just another way to look at maturing of bonds. Here's your present value of your annuity table. So what this says is if your payments are going to come in in multiple payments, then that's a present value of an annuity. So same kind of thing. Here's our rate and here's our periods. So let's say we have present value of, of a thousand dollar bond due in two years at 10% compounded annually. So if you go to Exhibit 3, you have the, the $1,000 times the 82,645 gives you $826. Then you have the present value of the two interest payments. So the 10% times the $1,000 uh, is 
and then that comes every um, every year so that there's the present value of the interest payments so the first example we did showed you how to calculate the 826 then the second calculation showed you where the 173 came from so that's the total present value of a bond um, that matures at a thousand dollars I realize that's a lot of information so I want you to go back to these slides print them out look at them and make sure the calculations make sense to you from the exhibits that are in the lecture so here's another example you calculate the present value of twenty thousand dollar five percent five-year bond that pays a thousand dollars interest annually if the market rate of interest is five percent so before you maybe you want to stop the lecture go back to exhibit three and four and see that you can actually do this and once you do that, turn the lecture back on, and I will show you the calculation. Same thing. You take the present value of the, of the bond at maturity, and you bring it back to time zero. And then you take the present value of the five interest payments using the annuity table back to time zero. And there's your rounded amount to the nearest dollar. All right, let's talk about journalizing entries for bonds payable. On January 2007, a corporation issues for cash 100,000 of 12% five-year bonds, interest payable semi-annually. The market rate is 12%. Okay, so the contract rate and the market rate are the same. In your mind, what does that mean? It means they sell at par. So here's your present value, your face amount. So you do you calculate your present value of the bond and of the interest payments. So the total present value of the bonds is 100,000. So here's our journal entry, cash of, of 100,000, bonds pay of 100,000 because it sold, market rate was the same as contract rate, so it, there was no premium or discount. Here's your interest payment calculation for the first one, interest expense, cash, so there you are, the company making the first six month interest payment. Then the bonds matured on December 31, so you're going to totally take the debt off your books at that point and get cash at that point. So those are your basic journal entries for bond accounting. Now let's assume that the market rate is 13 percent rather than 12 percent. So now you have an interest where the a, a situation where the market rate is greater than the contract rate so that means that you're gonna sell it at a let's calculate it. Here's our present value. Notice our present value is less based on the calculations than the um, face value of the bond. So the accounting for that is there's our cash. We get less than face amount. So we sold it at a discount. So hopefully seeing the journal entry will help you understand that when the market rate varies from the contract rate, this is where the discount and premium comes into play. Okay, so now on the first day of the fiscal year, the company issues a million dollars, 6% five-year bonds, and um, they received cash of 845000 So here they tell you that you got less than the million. So here's our journal entry. There's two methods to amortize a bond discount. There's the straight line, just like doing straight line depreciation and the effective interest rate. Both methods amortize the same total amount of discount over the life of the bonds. Why do we want to amortize the discount over the life of the bond? The same reason that we do depreciation on fixed assets. GAAP requires you to recognize revenue and expense in the right same in the period that it's earned or incurred. So you must do this. So here's our interest expense. Here's our discount on bond payable. So here's our um, straight line method of amortizing that discount by taking one tenth of the discount. And here's our journal entry. If the market rate of interest is 11% and the contract rate is 12%, then the bonds will sell at greater than face value, so they'll sell at a premium. So here's our calculation based on Exhibit 3 and 4. So walk yourself back through Exhibit 3 and 4. Make sure you can do this. Here's our journal entry. Notice we get more cash than the face amount, so we have a premium. Now we need to amortize that premium by running it through interest expense, reducing the premium, and um, paying out the cash at the time that we make the interest payment. The interest payment cash portion is always based on the stated value. The amount that runs through the expense is based on the market rate. Using the previous example, here's the journal entry. Zero coupon bonds do not provide for interest payments, only the face amount is paid at maturity so that you have to assume there's interest embedded in it. 
So the present value of $100,000 bonds due in five years at 13% compounded semi-annually, you would calculate the present value um, of $1 for 10 periods, and you would, you would um, impute that interest. So here's your cash, here's your discount on bonds payable, and here's your bonds payable. This is issued zero coupon bonds with a market rate and no stated rate. Let's talk about the um, payment and redemption of bonds payable. Since the payment of bonds normally involves a large amount of cash, a bond indenture may require that cash to be periodically transferred into a special cash fund called a sinking fund. So if you're, if you're doing bond, um, you have bonds issued outstanding, you as a company have to keep a certain amount of cash in a sinking fund, especially if you don't have great credit as a company. A corporation may call or redeem bonds before they mature. Those are called callable bonds. Um, they have to be um, stated that way when they're issued. Normally the call price is above the face value, otherwise nobody would buy a callable bond. So here is your um, call on a bond. The bonds come off your books. If there's any premium or discount left on your books, you get that off. And then you would either have a gain or a sell on the bonds, depending on what call price you had to ish, um, call them at. Here, um, let's just say now on June 30th, the corporation calls the bonds for 105. So here they have a loss. So the first example, they had a gain, and here they have a loss. De if you need to call your bonds back, you're going to pay the stated rate, the going rate on the stock exchange, and, and you're just kind of stuck. So this is the example. Now let's assume there's 500,000 bond issues on which there is unamortized discount of 40,000 is redeemed for 475. To journalize the redemption, you're going to take the bonds off your books for the amount you've got them on your books at, take the discount off, and the difference is going to be a gain or a loss. So this is where T accounting really comes in handy. All right, let's move on to installment notes. Installment notes, you learned um, basic note principles in the short-term debt section. An installment note is a debt that requires the borrower to make equal periodic payments to the lender. Unlike bonds, a note payment consists of a payment of a portion of the amount initially borrowed. Think of your mortgage if you have a mortgage or a car payment. So here you have a company that issues a 24,006% five-year note. So at the point that they issue the note, they put debt on their books and they get cash. Then when they make the payment, they have interest expense, just like if you were making a mortgage payment, uh, and some principal and cash. Um, and here's your next payment on December 31. And then, again, at the time that the final payment's made. And then at that point, the note payable should be zero. So here's like a little example of an amortization of an installment note. So each time you make a payment, it's always the same amount. However, the debt amount um, and the interest payment are going to change over time. So here, notice the principal goes up and the interest goes down and overall. So you're, we're actually going to do this, um, this example in Accounting 104. Financial statement presentation. Okay, finally, this is what it all looks like. Up to, t to now, you've learned about all the current liabilities, and now we've expanded our long-term debt section to include bonds and notes payable to get total liabilities. I realize I, um, let's cover one more thing, times interest um, charges earned is a, is a ratio that companies are measured on. It is an income before income tax and interest expense divided by interest expense. So here's an example where you have um, income before income tax of $152 million plus interest expense divided by um, interest expense. And you get this number, 462. And then you compare yourselves to other companies to make sure that your time, number of times your interest charged isn't, isn't out of whack compared to your, your um, industry. In summary, we talked about financing corporations, bond terms and characteristics, time value of money, accounting for bonds, accounting for notes, and financial statement presentation. There was a lot in this lecture. I speak quickly. I understand that. Um, print the slides out. I, I speak quickly so that it doesn't take you forever to listen to me. You're more than welcome to listen to me more than once. Um, please send me any emails if you have any questions. Look at the PowerPoints that go with the book along with these lectures, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.